Right. Well, it's Tiny Chat and painting time again, and today I thought I would discuss um, the law of identity and breaches to the law of identity um, in terms of, of just looking at the idea of x equals x. x equals x. Excuse me, my cat. <laughs> Woo. There you go. There you go. Get lost over there, kitty. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so so it dawned on me a while back that um that there's you know, that x equals x a equals A in one context does not is not valid in, in all contexts. When you move X equals X into another context, it's gonna it's gonna equal something else. There's gonna be there's gonna be a break such that, that X does not equal X any longer. And a case a case of that would be to say, um, like, the color green. Like, hey, look at the color green over there and think about color theory. And, and then consider that green is there and it's present. That particular waveform is there and it's present. But then think that you're talking to a colorblind individual that can't see that green and you're still having a conversation with them. Well, if green equals green, and you're assuming that green equals green in this case, well, in this other perceptual universe, it doesn't, it doesn't equate, it doesn't, it doesn't equal green any longer. X ceases to equal X. And this could be the case for, for value systems as well, in terms of what is bad what is considered bad and how bad is bad considered bad you know is pain a bad well if you move it you know from one case to a subjective case an objective case to a subjective case you know it might not seem that bad I mean take for instance the recent Poodle Susan video that she has with a moral relativist not dissimilar to myself who says that you know, pain and pleasure are firing the same center of the brain, and that it's okay to invite different, different pains, different, different pain sensation. Well, what is that person's subjective experience? Is pain always a bad? Is X equal X? Is pain pain? Is the same stimulus the same stimulus? And this brings up the idea of, <clears throat> of the law of excluded middle, you know. The law of excluded middle, the law of non-contradiction, the law of identity are all three laws of logic. And Wittgenstein damned the law of excluded middle, like he left it all down to the individual how the individual interacts with its environment. And he had an appendectomy without any anesthesia and got through it just fine. And it's not to say that he didn't have pain, but his notion of how he was going to deal pain was definitely not the way the average person would deal with pain. But I bring up the law of identity because I keep talking about deconstructing the law of identity, like break it apart, lose it. And what I'm getting at is, you know, move from one perceptual lens to another perceptual lens. See a shift in, you know, dogma A that you adhere to evaporates when it's under a different condition, when it's under a different context. It can disappear. You can leave naturalism behind. You can leave science behind and get into more lofty sort of discussions about what's possible, what the human condition is made of, 
And I think of Chomsky's generative grammar, where, for example, if you took the statement, Joe goes to the store, and Joe was A, and goes was B, and store was C, A, B, and C, and they were all uppercase A, B, and C, the generative grammar would be something, and I, I might be having this wrong, I might be utilizing the generative grammar model in an incorrect way here, but Joe goes to the store, and then if you want to switch store for bank, then what you do is you say capital A, capital B, lowercase c, and you install the bank equivalent to lowercase c. So c, c, c equals c, but lowercase and uppercase c, even though they're similar and they can be interchanged, in one, one realm, they're not interchanged in the other realm. They're still C's. The identity of them is still a C. But you change something about them, kind of like changing a font. And then the association with the font becomes different, and hence the identity becomes different. And that's the idea kind of behind deconstructing the law of identity. But self-evaluation, what is the I? The I is a public figure. The I as what you look at in the mirror. I, the lingual, the lingual use of the word I. And there's lots of different ways to look at, at the word I. And so you can shift from one sense of I to another sense of I. So I, I, I wanted to say that wanted to go ahead and say that. And perhaps instead of doing a long drawn out video while waiting to see if anybody's actually going to come into my tiny chat room, because <laughs> I just started it, um, I could probably just stop the video right here and get people's critique on it. Get your feedback if you have any. Let me know what you think about the law of identity and how how strict it is, how strict it should always be, and then if you think it should always be strict, if you're always adhering to it, then see if you can find another means of identification to see whether or not that identity shifts, whether or not you can upset your law of identity, the rules that you're using for all inferences, for all a priori sets for all synthetic sets. Anyway, what else could I possibly say on that before I let you go? Oh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm painting hell again, so I bought a pack of cigarettes, but I smoked them already, so I went out today and I got a vaporizer. Yep, a blueberry vaporizer. Well, I have someone in the room already, but I'm just going to end this video right here. Thanks for liking my Mohawk.